questions, maybe we can do questions um, at the end or if it's really urgent, um, just, just uh, let us know. Um, so really for any of you who've been working in the data, polar data world for uh, some time now, you know it's been quite busy, particularly in the last decade or so since the International Polar Year. Um, there's been a lot in the way of discussions, workshops, reports, etc. cetera. Um, we have discovered, particularly over the last couple of years, and I would say this is probably as a result of the International Polar Year, um, we have a, a lot of new organizations, initiatives, sort of infrastructure programs, et cetera, that have evolved or emerged uh, over the last few years. Um, there's just a few logos here from groups that we've been interacting with um, over the last couple of years. Um, the one I'm most involved with at the international level is the one that Martin mentioned, the Arctic Data Committee. So this is a committee of the International Arctic Science Committee and the Sustaining Arctic Observing Networks Program. Um, and really the role we've been trying to play is to try and, and be some glue or sort of to help facilitate the conversations and bring, bring people together to discuss what we need to do, how we're going to do it, and, and increasingly um, starting to do it. Um, we also uh, are focused on trying to make the connections between, you know, the data community and the science community through IASC and then through the observing community and those who are designing the observing system through SEON. Um, said it's more than just the Arctic Data Committee, of course, we're, we're co-organizing a lot of these events and these initiatives and efforts. Um, with, with a number of different groups who have been part of various uh, past workshops and who will be um, in many cases participating in the Geneva workshop and beyond. Um, U.S. initiatives, we are on an IARPIC call at the moment, so I'm sort of co-hosting this uh, with international partners, but also the U.S. Interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee. Um, so we have a lot happening in the U.S., um, and there are some sort of what I'll call parallel or, or complementary initiatives to try and, and bring those, those um, groups, those projects together as well to, to focus on national coordination so we can more effectively connect at the international level. Um, also a lot going on in various um, you know, communities of practice or subcommunities, whatever you want to call them. Uh, for example, the indigenous and community-based monitoring and data have a whole bunch of activities happening, different infrastructures being developed, new data platforms, and so on. Um, so there's a, there's a lot happening, and there's in some ways more than you know one small group can uh, track. But on the other hand, I think we're doing a really good job uh, increasingly at trying to make connections across these different communities. Um, just in terms of quickly some recent workshops and meetings uh, in Frascati, Italy in November of 2016, uh, we had a workshop focused on uh, interoperability and sort of looking at some of the issues there. Uh, an interesting sort of, I think, agreement amongst the, the 60 or so people who participated in that was that uh, although we definitely have technical challenges, um, you know, and, and, and work that we need to do, a lot of what we're really dealing with now are social and organizational challenges of how we can most effectively work together. Um, and, you know, as we address those challenges, where the feeling was more and more we'll be able to, um, to nail the, the uh, technical challenges. Uh, the Arctic Data Committee, along with the Standing Committee for Antarctic Data um, and the Southern Ocean Observing System, all met in Montreal in September of 2017. Um, seems like many years ago, it was only just a year ago now, um, and really what we started to do there was say that this is not just an Arctic issue or an Antarctic, it's a polar issue, and in some ways it's, it's very global. A lot of the t things we're talking about are, are global in scope. Um, so we're working together to try and make sure that we're effective, efficient, we're not duplicating, um, and then also working with the broader global community. So what we did in this case was we organized the meetings for two and a half days uh, in conjunction with the Research Data Alliance meeting in Montreal. And then we went on to interact with the global community at the RDA meeting. Um, a meeting that happened in May of this year that was an NSF funded workshop, but very much an international collaboration uh, was the Polar Data Planning Summit held uh, in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, so a number of us got together and we really started to go from 
trying to identify the issues to trying to figure out, you know, how are we going to work on these together and actually getting some work done, which was the case there. So I'll, I'll touch on that in a, in a few minutes. But um, one of the, I think, distinctions between this meeting and maybe some others like the Polar Data Forum that were more like a conference style, uh, this was very much uh, aimed to be a working meeting, and it was also targeted at groups and, and programs who are funded and have activities ongoing. Um, so who are not there to sort of just envision what we might do, but actually have resources to do some of the work. Um, that led a few weeks later to the Arctic Observing Summit and the Polar 2018 conference that was held in Davos. So I think there were a couple of thousand people there and the Arctic Observing Summit had um, a few hundred and there was a subgroup that talked about uh, data specifically, uh, working group four under sub theme two. Um, and a result of that, which culminated both from the Boulder meeting and, and the meetings in Davos was on very short notice, we were asked to prepare um, a deliverable statement for the upcoming Arctic Science Ministerial that's happening in Berlin about a month from now um, on the 25th and 26th. So the 25th is a um, meeting for the science community and then the 26th, the ministers will meet. Um, so we worked together very quickly. It was, I think, a two or three day deadline um, because they were finishing up things and what we did was just put together a, a statement that really, I think, just followed on a lot of the conversations we've been having internationally um, for several years now, which says we have a lot of, you know, pieces in place and now we need to put those pieces together. Um, so the first event identified in that deliverable statement is a meeting in Geneva. We're calling it now the Polar Data and Systems Architecture Workshop. Initially, this was the annual meeting of the Arctic Data Committee, but when people were indicating that they would like to keep the momentum going from the various other meetings we've been having, uh, we sort of transformed that now into a more general meeting about um, systems uh, architecture. Um, so what we're really trying to do here today is to take some of those pieces, and I'm just going to quickly go through some of the pieces that have being discussed uh, in various meetings. Um, federated search has been a very large topic. So how do we get all of the various catalogs uh, connected and working together in an interoperable way so that people can discover data? Um, and in Boulder, that was really the focus of the work. Uh, we put out different ideas around, you know, let's talk about data interoperability and so on. Um, but you'll see in the, the center picture there, the technical group said, let's focus on federated search and then take it from there. Um, so they're continuing to work on, on a number of activities. Uh, one of them is a white paper that's looking at identifying various uh, discovery portals and so on and the protocols that they're using to share the data. Um, I know there are a number of other initiatives going on out there, both in our community and in the broader community. Um, also a lot of discussion about semantics and there's now a semantics working group um, and vocabularies working group that's looking at that aspect of interoperability. Um, you know, we talked about standards and services. What are the different standards, protocols, et cetera, that could be used in a distributed system um, that, that is emerging. Um, uh, something that's really starting to become a popular topic and an important one is the where cloud platforms or virtual research environments fit and what interoperability between those types of platforms um, look like. And then education and training always comes up as well. How do we ensure that we have people who are able to engage in our domain, um, and particularly early career uh, researchers, um, young community members, and so on. So moving forward, um, we, we know that we're looking at a distributed architecture. Sometimes we talk about, well, centralized and so on, but the, the simple fact is, is that we have many different organizations, different countries uh, who are all playing in this space and who are for various reasons going to be developing their own infrastructures. And so we're looking at how do we architect a distributed interoperable system rather than thinking that we'll have this sort of one monolithic system. Um, so these are just some abstract diagrams from some of the work that I've done. And then the, this diagram here is from the Arctic Spatial Data Infrastructure. It's already sort of building on work that's been done at various national mapping agencies and applying it to the Arctic. 
So there's a website. Um, the URL is there. Uh, if you go to arcticdc.org and then just follow the menus to meetings and then conferences, um, there's a current agenda. And the agenda at the moment is very much draft. And the purpose of this meeting is to get some conversation going as to what that agenda should look like um, from your perspective or um, from the perspective of people you're representing. Um, at the moment, the first half day, uh, I'm starting it, uh, or the plan is to start at about midday, and that just gives people who are flying in from other places some time to get to the meeting and so on. Um, the, the first half day actually is for our data committee business meeting, so members of that uh, committee will, will meet um, in sort of, it's an open meeting, but not everyone will necessarily want to attend that. Uh, but the conference or the workshop itself will get started in the, on the first afternoon. And the idea is to start with some presentations of initiatives, programs, pro, uh, uh, et cetera, who already have a pretty well-developed um, architecture and particularly distributed architecture. Um, so we'll likely give a little bit more time to groups like the Arctic Spatial Data Infrastructure. Bill and Allison talked about some of the work that they're doing um, at RMAP AOV where they have operational interoperable systems going. Um, we have a number of others who are, are doing work in that area. So we will we'll definitely have to, to juggle because we have a lot of different groups who can fit into that category. So we'll likely give some sort of keynotes to a few and then as much time as we can to everybody else. But we just want to give people a sense of what's already happening because the whole effort is uh, revolving around leveraging existing effort rather than reinventing the wheel. Um, on the second day, the current uh, suggestion or the current draft looks at having uh, at least two streams. So one stream would be a stream that would focus on continuing, and this is called working session two. I'm gonna go backwards here, but um, continuing the work that's being done around federated search. So there are a group of really active, focused folks who really want to get together again and, and keep that work moving. And so the idea is to give that space here to continue doing that. Um, the other session, working session one, would be looking at things more broadly um, and trying to piece together the different uh, aspects of infrastructure. Um, and so federated search and discovery, of course, is one component of the architecture, but we also have things like you see over here, like the um, physical infrastructure, uh, what kind of implementation softwares are we looking at, standards and specifications, uh, exchange protocols for data, semantics, et cetera. And then also what I'll call the software aspects or the human aspects, which are community building, you know, coordination, uh, governance around standards and things like that. Um, so people, I think to a great extent will, the idea is to have them kind of self-organize and choose where they go. It may be a challenge at times, um, you know, with people having, you know, common interests in, in both or similar interests in both. Um, but there are sections, and I don't have it up on the screen here on day three, where we'll basically be bringing everybody back together to try and, and piece it together and say, okay, for those who are working on federated search, you know, come back on day three, tell us what you've figured out, and then see how that fits into the broader uh, into the broader discussion uh, about the overall architecture. So I'll end it there, and I just want to go into a dialogue, and please... Uh, don't be shy. Uh, this is a sort of a really informal, so you know it won't be won't be quoted unless you want us to quote you. Um, and just you know, feel free to throw out ideas. And these are just some ideas that I put on the original um, the original agenda for this meeting. Uh, so you know, do people have thoughts on defining the term architecture? Architecture to some people is a very very technical thing. In other people's definition, it would include you know the the governance, the community building, all of that. Um, so you know, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, do you have thoughts on what you think may or may not work for the agenda of the workshop? Um, standards and protocols, or the particular standards and protocols we want to make sure are on the agenda explicitly. Uh, certainly, we know OGC is something that's that's used by many, and uh, unfortunately, Simon Riapel, unless he's joined, uh, I spoke with them at length yesterday, they're going to be sending probably two to three representatives from OGC Europe and from the Arctic Spatial Data Infrastructure, so we'll definitely be highlighting that. WMO is using OpenDAP, et cetera, so other protocols. Um, other groups, 
organizations that we should be engaging? Um, are there use cases you'd like to see identified? One use case that we have for sure that I'll be adding to the agenda is uh, AMAP, the Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program, has approached us to see if we could talk about um, helping to uh, support their assessments through this process and see how we would uh, better uh, engage and enable data for their assessment processes. Uh, and then specifically for those of you who are engaged in IARPIC, you know what kind of role might we play? So with that, I will stop speaking and try and limit how much I talk and let you um, add to our conversation. So I'm just trying to figure out how to stop sharing my screen. And there we go. Um, actually, maybe I'll, I'll keep the share on just for a moment, just so we have those points up and running. Um, get my PowerPoint back going here. Sorry, indulge me here for a moment. And okay, so with that, I'd like to open up the floor to comments, thoughts, suggestions, etc. Hey, uh, this is Giri, I think. I mean, uh, this has been really uh, useful and informative. Uh, thank you, Peter. A uh, couple of comments on the architecture and uh, just browsing through the, the session agenda that you have. Um, it, again, like just scanning through this information, not uh, spending too much time on that. This looks like a very, I guess, like focused on data interoperability and uh, metadata sharing and the protocols that are needed in order to share the data. Um, so, or I mean, the architecture. Are you also considering uh, the software architectures that are currently um, used by various scientific communities, <clears throat> and as well as like uh, computing architectures that helps for bigger data analytics or like data interoperability uh, interpretation activities? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, in a lot of ways as well, we're, we're not starting from scratch with this meeting, said it's sort of following on from conversations that have been happening. Um, so that's definitely part of it. Um, and I think with your comment, we'll definitely make sure to highlight. We particularly have some groups that will be coming and they have particular software stacks that they're using. Um, so, for example, uh, Catherine's group, um, uh, NSF Arctic Data Center, uses a, a platform called Data One, and that mm -hmm. may not be the best way to describe it. And you may be familiar with Data One, but they're going to be telling us a bit more about, you know, the specifics of how their systems are architected. Uh, the Arctic Spatial Data Infrastructure folks um, have particular software that they tend to use. I mean, OGC mm -hmm. is is in some ways software agnostic, but there are tools that people tend to use. Um, so, so that's definitely the kind of detail that we want to start getting into in, in, at a higher, you know, in more detail, sorry, in Geneva, um, because up until now, we've tended to talk a little bit more abstractly, uh, and we want to be able to start, you know, giving people a sense of if they're not already doing the, the architecting or the development, you know, what could they be using? Okay, okay thank you. Yeah. So yeah, I've been involved with Data One and also with uh, Mark Peterson uh, for Mark Parsons for a long time, and many of the metadata standards and protocols that you outlined in there. It it I think like most of the data bigger data intensive science projects they already follow them in a in a sense and participate with um, with broader portals like data one um, uh, or even in some cases data.gov so so you i mean like what i'm hearing from you is like you will you'll not reinvent the wheel which is really good to hear and um, we uh, you will be able to tap into those broader clearinghouse data portals and um, the work that has been done so far right yeah i think that's the idea and uh, I'll just say briefly, um, at the meeting in Boulder in May, the analysis that they were doing of the various discovery portals um, revealed, for example, uh, that I think over 90%, almost 100% used either OpenSearch 
uh, OGC CSW or OII PMH for some sort of interoperability. And so, you know, the idea there was if we can figure that out and uh, formalize that a bit, we can start making at least de facto standards for the community to say that if you're at least operating, you know, using one of these protocols, then you should be more or less interoperable. Um, those are transport protocols, so we'd also need to figure out things like the semantics, vocabularies, and so on. Okay. Yeah. So. Okay. Thank you. Talking okay. about the protocols, like um, I'm also thinking, like you would be talk uh, discussing about data transfer protocols, um, the actual data itself, like how how you want to transport from one center to other center, or like one analysis platform to another platform. Um, thinking about like Globus online or or even threads and other things. Yeah, and that's where I think we'll start moving into the details of structure and whether we're also talking about, you know, tabular data, linked open data, you know, things like that. And so I suspect starting in Geneva, it won't be the end. Certainly we'll have a number of other opportunities after that. Um, we want to start getting into those details. Great, thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Um, suggestions. Hi, uh, this is Bill Manley. So, um, Peter, I think it's great. I, I won't be able to attend this workshop, but uh, I think it's great that you continue in the same sort of structure as the Polar Data Planning Center in Boulder, where there's these working sessions. And uh, I think that works really well. And in having two concurrent technical tracks, a uh, technical track and then a context and scenarios track. And I'm sure you've already thought of this and, and it's already baked in. Um, but one thing I noticed at that meeting is that, you know, certain people gravitate to one or the other and then they stick in that track. Mm -hmm. And so um, we don't want people's perspectives to remain in their own silos really. So it's really important with uh, those summaries when the whole group comes back together and shares what they've found, we need to encourage people to float. Okay. So yeah, maybe some sort of musical chairs type thing that we need to get people yeah, roaming around even if it's not their, their full expertise or their comfort zone. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. Uh, a, a quick question. To miss out on, on key points from the other track. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, a question for you as well, Bill, that's not specific to that, but um, in terms of your attendance, um, you could say this either in this group or, or just send me something, but I'm interested to know if people are attending or are not attending, um, you know, particularly if they're not attending, is the reason, you know, funding, uh, is it time and so on? Um, because one of the things we talked about in Boulder was we're trying to make this um, accessible to people as a process uh, and we're trying to establish how, you know, how we can best do that. Is that through establishing funding? Is it through you know, just making it more convenient by holding it you know, in conjunction with other meetings and so on? So. Uh, well, for me and our map, Sasha, we um, let's see. I'm sorry. Where is it? Is it in Davos? Uh, Geneva this time. Geneva. Yeah, the WMO. Uh-huh. Um, <clears throat> well, the main barrier is that, uh, we have very limited travel budget just because of budgetary constraints. Okay. Um, uh, and because of that, I haven't really thought beyond it in terms of, uh, time constraints. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I think, I think, a number of us as well it's that and then it's a, a bit harder sometimes to justify international travel so that's something i'm just trying to document so as we go forward we can try and alleviate any of those issues as much as we can yeah international travel is a challenge mm -hmm. yeah. okay will there Thanks, be remote participation <laughs> there will um so if you go to the website there's just a placeholder now that says it will be zoom um and yeah, great. i'm coming up with trying to come up with creative uh, solutions like the one we figured out in, in Boulder where we're going to use cell phones as uh, remote microphones um, because audio is often an issue and we'll try and have you know loudspeakers and things like that. Uh, it could make for an early or late day depending on where you are in the world but we have at least half a dozen people who have said that they will be signing in uh, through the virtual participation. So. Great. Okay. 
Any other comments, suggestions? So the agenda topics that you have for both working sessions, are those set or are, are you anticipating more topics? No, so that's what this process, and we'll probably have, like said, at least probably two other web meetings um, to okay. try and make sure we cover. What we have found in the past, though, with some of our other meetings, like the Polar Data Forum and the Frascati Workshop, is that if we go too broad, uh, depending, of course, how many people we have there, we end up with, you know, uh, we don't probably get quite as much done because there's just a smaller number of people per theme. And um, so we're trying to balance having, you know, a breadth of topics, but also being able to really dig deep into the weeds. So what we may do is if we come up with, let's say, five or six topics, we may say, okay, the Geneva workshop will be focused you know, on two or three of those. And then we're looking at having um, several other meetings in the coming year to two years. Uh, and we could focus on different topics at different meetings. Oh, okay. okay. This is Bill Manling, and I have a relatively minor comment. Um, sure. So this is my first time looking at the agenda. And so on uh, Friday, uh, the working sessions, preparation for plenary presentation. I'm just a little confused about what that is. So, um, sorry, I just have to try and get back to my screen that I'm not sharing. Uh, the idea is that we would have these two tracks, but then we're going to merge or come back together. Yes. Um, so the idea there is that the first session of the set last day, each se section or each track will spend time doing what you're saying is making sure that they're yes. doing a really good job of communicating this and then we'll move, bring everybody back together. I'm not sure. I think maybe that session one of day three might be better for the last session of day two. And we could spend, you know, pretty much the whole day together on day three, but I'm just trying to sort of flex that right now. Oh, I'll get it. That's great. Yeah. Um, one, one thing I would ask uh, anybody who is not planning to attend is if you are not, would you be, would, would you be able to interested in submitting something to the process that would outline your systems, your architecture, your interests, et cetera? Um, because we, even though, you know, you're not necessarily there in person. We don't want to have that as a barrier to having your voice heard or your systems exposed. Um, well, Jim can confirm from arm side, but uh, we'd be happy to do that. Um, Great, because um, DOE, for example, is a group I'm familiar with through IARPIC, but, um, you know, we're starting to see different groups come out who actually have yet yeah, some really well-developed infrastructure and architectures, and anything we can draw from that, I think, would be excellent. Sure. sure. Yeah, we have been doing a lot of data interoperability and um, metadata and data sharing activities using various community standards, so I'd be happy to provide that detail. Okay, great. Same here. Hi, Peter. This is Allison. I, I think that's a great idea. And I, and I was curious if this is along the lines of what you guys were building with the, the matrix, matrix last spring. Is that what you had in mind? Yeah, so the matrix is uh, discovery portal specific. So that's the group um, that from Boulder has sort of continued. And I think Pip's trying to get another conference call to keep working on the white paper. Um, and what I'd like to do is if we could sort of do that, but start going up into the broader architecture. So again, seeing discovery as one component of an architecture, but we also have to think, and Oystein keeps telling me this, we have to get onto the data. Uh, we sure. have to figure out you know, how we're gonna move data around as well. And I'm also really quite interested in the, in the human components of the architecture um, in how are we going to sort of continue to work together and so on, even though that might be a different diagram. So. Gotcha. Well, I think it's a great idea to, you know, get that input from groups that can attend. We'd be okay. happy to submit some, something. Okay. Well, you know, what I may think about doing that is on the site, we can say people are welcome and encouraged to submit before the meeting, but also have a period after the meeting um, where we can, you know, try and share the results of the meeting and then 
uh, get people to sort of comment on those, et cetera. Um, we are seeing this, uh, I, I made a presentation on this last year at the Arctic Change Conference, and I, I said, you know, this is, these are all just sort of stops along the trail, uh, because we know this isn't going to happen in, in one meeting or two meetings, um, so we may have to make sure it's an open process. Okay, Great. Any, any other thoughts, comments, critiques? A specific question I have that I'm interested in is we, we piloted this a little bit or we tested it a little bit in Boulder um, and I, I think probably didn't have the, the results I had hoped for but I, I'm interested is the idea of using use cases to guide the discussion, um, particular use cases and I'm, I'm particularly interested for this upcoming meeting because AMAP is making this request. Um, do you find that helpful? Do you find it sort of constraining, disruptive? Um, you know, what's the value of trying to, at this stage anyway, to think about particular use cases uh, when we're in the design process? Uh, this is Peter from Bass. Uh, I think they're a good idea, actually. Demonstration is often more powerful than explanation sometimes. Um, and similar to Oystein, we at Bass are more and more in need of actually getting the data to people. And we're coming more to the view, rather than providing a portal directly for the data, is to provide APIs onto the data so that people can programmatically access and do with it what they want more directly because we often find that if we start creating portals, someone's disappointed or it doesn't quite get the data in the way in which they were anticipating. Whereas if you're able to produce some form of programmatic access through an API, through which you can still put constraints on if there is are constraints to be placed on the data, then um, they can then access the data in exactly the way that they wish to do so. So, you know, we're beginning to think about accessing and creating things to do just that. Um, so, uh, and to be able to produce something which demonstrates that, I think would be a good thing to show and discuss. Okay, thank you. Any other thoughts? For the use cases, I guess, like I would ask you a follow-up question: um, What what do you anticipate the outcome? Is it going to be like a data portal for uh, for this specific purpose, with like allowing the scientists to not only discover the data and also like um, uh, that are actually archived and distributed from multiple sources, and make make it. I mean, like all the way what um, Peter said, like access the data through API, or is it just like coming up for the outcome is to come up with like set of protocol standards that would be supported for from this initiative? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think our experience in the sort of uh, use cases we started in Boulder, there were two use cases. One was on extreme cryospheric events um you know uh, sea ice permafrost and so on and the other was on um biological uh, uh marine biological resource management and in those cases what i think is each use case was was different um so in the case of the extreme cryospheric events i think the end product would be something along the lines of a portal that you know community members and uh disaster response people could access or you know planners uh for the just uh, marine management, they tended to have a number of different systems and it was more along the lines of what Peter was describing is those systems are in place to do the analysis, but they don't have a complete set of data um, to, to do the best analysis. So they're looking more at, you know, APIs. Um, and so if we had the, the AMAP use case, you know, AMAP is producing typically reports through their assessments. And so they're looking at things like how do we get not only access to the data, but how do we visualize it, create graphs and so on. Um, but 
typically from distributed sources. So the thought was for Geneva is, you know, we could probably have a, a little bit of a menu of use cases and depending on what people are working on and, you know, whether they're thinking about data interoperability or discovery or, you know, whatever, they could try to say, okay, if we're creating this architectural design, could it serve this particular use case? Um, and I, I think that could be really valuable for our community because often we're working in a bit of an abstract environment where we say, well, it could be useful for all these different things. And as Peter points out, sometimes, you know, demonstrations a lot better than, than uh, explanations. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that helps because many of these use cases, even the one that you just explained, <clears throat> it quickly goes beyond metadata sharing and discovery mm -hmm. of the data, right? Like, yeah, we all yeah. use the IS 19115 or FGDC metadata standards or even OGC protocols to transfer. But when it comes to the use case you explained, like it, it involves actually taking the data from disparate sources and then like run it in an analysis platform. And that's where you get to face or the scientists get to face a lot of um, challenges in terms of changing the data or converting the data into a common data platform or something, right? So, so um, I'm not seeing that level of discussion in this agenda. Is that beyond the scope or? No, so this is, this is where it really interesting because in Boulder, if you go to the same website, um, the Arctic Data Committee, there's the presentation from the uh, Polar Data Planning Summit. So there we had articulated a couple of, of really sort of detailed use cases, um, the ones I talked about. Um, but the, the stage we were at, I think, with the team there, they said, okay, someday we would like to address that. <laughs> But for now, we need to step back and sort of take a smaller chunk and focus on the discovery. Um, but those use cases, in a, in a way, are sort of sitting there in the parking lot uh, waiting. And we actually have scientists, um, both in the, in the Arctic and Antarctic, who are interested, for example, for the marine um, resource management under CAMELAR, uh, uh, looking at, at that. And then there's a whole group of um, scientists and policymakers interested for the potential uh, Arctic, central Arctic Ocean fishery, which doesn't yet exist, but probably will someday. Um, so I think it's just a matter of evolution as it's not kind of in this agenda, but I think it's, it's moving in that direction. Okay. Yeah, Bill, man, you got So um, I think it's tremendously useful to have the use cases uh, outlined ahead of time, to have in your pocket, to structure thinking ahead of time or during the conference or, or to um, really be able to dig into where the rubber hits the road if okay. things get too far astray. Uh, that said, with the Boulder meeting, it's true. It's like we never got into the use cases. It, it just uh, kind of in that context as a group, it just naturally evolved into doing what we needed to do at the time, which was uh, – not really focused, like we, we lost that use case fo focus. And I think that's okay. And so I think uh, it's important as part of the process to have some use cases outlined to help structure at least the initial thinking or to fall back on. Um, but if you were to like really make progress on a particular use case for interoperability, it might require a separate workshop, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that has come up actually with our science partners as well, the, the, at least this small subset that we've discussed the use cases with. Um, and I think that's probably where we'd be headed is when the data community kind of feels suitably far along is bringing together the data community with the, the scientific and or individual communities in the Arctic and so on and working on particular use cases. Um, yeah, and, and to mention one the thing that's going on right now is that um, – ISOA is creating these, um, what are they called? Um, these packages with user added uh, benefit to the YAP uh, data collections. And so they themselves are like facing this huge interoperability challenge. And that's really where the rubber hits the road. Um, actually, it might be helpful to have a presentation uh, from them. 
Yeah, and actually that was really great to Neil Utah of, of ISOA, which is an atmospheric data group, um, was in Davos with us. Uh, and so we heard a lot about their work with the year of polar prediction. Um, so yeah, that, that's a great, great suggestion, Bill. And we'll reach out to see, um, I believe Sandy's coming, Sandy Starkweather, and she has connections to it, but it'd be great to have people who are, who are in the, the weeds. So, um, okay, I just with respect to the use cases, uh, so we do have the two use cases that have already been developed, and I think we can refine those. There is a meeting, I believe, tomorrow, um, an AMAP meeting that they're having their general sort of meeting, and this is on their agenda. Um, and so I've indicated that, that I think we would like to, as a community, try and work with them on that, uh, but that we would need them to engage, uh, that they, they have to have some people and some time that they would be able to work with us to try and uh, elaborate on the use case, like the specifics of what they would need to support their assessment process. So that, that's one I think by the time the meeting hits in a couple of months, we will have more information on. Um, and one that may be from a, I'll call it political perspective, may be valuable because it's a very uh, concrete use case and it's also very prominent within the Arctic Council process. Okay, um, we're coming close to our time, um, not quite there yet, but just any other comments uh, in general, um, you know, ideas that you have, concerns that you have, et cetera, or anything that uh, knowing that there's probably going to be, you know, a couple of other meetings like this more with people in some cases from Europe, Asia, and so on, you know, any, anything that you'd like to insert into those meetings. I have something else, but I'll, defer to anybody else with respect to the time left. Okay, sure. All right, okay, if I cover something. Sure. So um, coming from the perspective of RMAP and AOV, we are um, something of an odd duck in that we are looking at project planning and network planning and integration and synthesis and discovery for observing sites. And so we are focused on uh, access and discovery and interoperability of project level metadata and site level metadata, which is quite different than most of the data community, appropriately so, is, is on data set level and metadata and data interoperability, if you follow me. Mm -hmm. um, so, as a community, those the small, the few organizations that are involved in this, uh, we're kind of behind the times a little bit um, in terms of interoperability and developing common standards. But one challenge that we're starting to realize is really a big one is that at least PIs and individual organizers uh, or uh, investigators, they're well aware that and have accepted that they have data submission requirements and they accept that usually as part of their funding and uh, so like part of a data management plan but the project level and site level information the metadata is incredibly difficult to obtain and it's not um, baked into the broader process and um, so I'm not sure what to say there other than you know at some point it might be terribly important to have this, these levels of metadata be uh, included in data management plans uh, or requirements for such. Um, um, but it's another challenge is that the networks themselves or the uh, science funding or planning offices themselves don't often have this information or are not able to uh, bring it together across a, a one would could say a fragmented uh, universe of uh, of their own networks, and so I'll just throw that out there. We're kind of an odd duck, uh, or an unusual subset of the data community uh, with its own challenges. And, and it's great if we can interlink and make interoperable these levels of metadata also. Great, thanks, Bill. And, and that I think is really important and connects to what I was saying earlier about 
what the architecture might include. And I think you've identified something that is, you know, a stream of information that should be included that goes beyond simply thinking about the data set, but also the context, the organizational context. So as you said, that would involve going to the funding agencies and saying, you know, the, this needs to be explicitly identified as a type of data that, that needs to come alongside the, the other data and so on. Um, so those are the types of things that I, I would like to sort of make sure that we capture as well as, you know, the more sort of um, day to day type data streams that we think about. Yeah, it's part of the project data life cycle, if you will. Yeah, and, and I think we need to be as a community as much as possible communicating to um, those who are designing those systems. Um, you know, the other parts of the data life cycle, including also working with the observing community. So that when they're deploying sensors, you know, are there data or metadata that needs to be collected and shared and, and captured along with the actual measurements that need to come back to the data centers and so on. So that's where our, you know, relationships with SAON and, and USAON and groups like that, I think are important because they're not always thinking about the downstream uh, or upstream, depending on how you look at it. Great, thanks. Okay, we're coming to an end, but any last comment or comments that, uh, that people want to make um, before we sign off? Okay, well, you have uh, an email contact either to me or through what we often do is ask people just to go on to the IARPIC uh, site and you can make comments um, after this meeting. Uh, one thing I will say is that uh, a theme that's not yet on the agenda that I think will be there, but I'm, I'm just not sure exactly when and where is this um, theme that came out in Boulder very strongly, which is we do need to have a group of people in our community working on how we, we keep this process going, um, and particularly the, the venues to do that, as well as the funding to do that. Um, so it's been a bit of a challenge because it's, it's been very, very busy um, and all of these meetings and so on have been happening very close together and, and rapidly, which is a good thing because I think we've got a lot of momentum going now. Uh, but we're also going to be, I think, spending some time for anybody who's interested in talking about, you know, how, how we keep all of this um, moving forward as a global community. So. Thanks a lot. Okay, um, I will say with that, we'll close the meeting. If you could just, yeah, pay attention to your emails over the coming weeks. Um, there'll be uh, some additional updates on Geneva and I think pretty much everything you need to register um, book travel if you're planning to attend is, uh, is on the website that I shared. And I'll add to that uh, as a closing remark, um, over the next few days, I will add a component that will uh, provide uh, instructions on how to submit uh, descriptions of your project program, et cetera, if you are not planning to attend. Right. Okay, thank you all. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.